I'm here with David Korowitz at the International Conference on Sustainability, Energy, Economy, and Environment. And we just heard your talk about resilience and non-resilience in the global economy um, and fragility and all those sorts of things. Um, and in reading one of your chapters for the book Fleeing Vesuvius, which just came out, I found this chart where you talked about different sorts of changes in ecosystems. And of course, the listeners can't see these charts, but you have them labeled A, B, C, and D. A looks like a smooth change. B looks like kind of, it, it's a downward quick slope. Uh, it's, a, it's a class, a black, black diamond a slope downwards. And then we have these small ones over here that uh, it looks like, I don't know exactly what no, it is. Uh, David, could you kind of explain these okay. to us? <clears throat> um, when I mentioned that we can talk about the globalized economy as a single entity that's had a particular dynamic state for about 150 years, and let's call that state the 3% growth state, relatively stable, um, fluctuations, of course, you start to say, oh, you know, here you have something that we know in lots of other situations, in ecosystems, in um, heart behavior, all sorts of things in nature, all sorts of things. And how we can look at this is the state of a system, which is stable, and a state variable. You know, and often states have a very small number of state variables. Those variables are effectively the thing that maintains or defines that state. And very often, they're energy. So it could be a lake system that is in a particular state. And you, know, you cross a point where one of the nutrient loads, the plankton or whatever in it, crosses a point, drops, and rather than the, the, the lake uh, dying slowly, bit by bit, as the nutrient load uh, falls away, it crosses a tipping point and drops. Boom, down. And this is how I represented the globalized economy. That, see those black lines, yeah? They are stable states. It is stable when it is on those lines. That means it doesn't change. So can I have the little pointer there? Um, here we have, uh, let's call that energy flows, or rising energy flows, energy flows plus whatever, to keep this thing growing at 3% per annum. Um, <clears throat> if the flows are at that level, it's stable. Uh, that's, that's just the growth economy, effectively. The, the conditions change, which is the state of the is the, growth, the size and complexity of the global economy. It gets more and more complex as the energy flow rises. Sometimes a small effect, you can just move it, a small effect can cause boom, and it drops to another stable state. That's where it's very sensitive. You could hold the system stable here, and the, you'd have those conditions, and it would just stand there. But our system is unstable to an energy withdrawal for lots of reasons that some of which I've mentioned. In those cases, you often have an unstable regime. And this is what a collapse situation is, where there is no stable state. This is unstable. It can't exist here. There is no stable state between where you were and where you're going to be. It is what a fall, a collapse is. There's nothing on the way. And how that usually happens is we talk of it as a positive feedback, but often it's many of them all interlaced together, helping each, each other fall down. And then you drop to another state. And it's really the dynamical systems view of what a collapse is. And this is a tipping point. Sometimes, you know, this is pushing it over a hill. You uh, give it a little bit of a um, kick the system. So the kick to this system might be if I wanted to uh, kick this system over a hill, what would I do? Um, 
I might, if I was Obama and the head of the IMF, say, we're going down. And that would take away that stability, knock us over the lip. So really all it is, it's very, it's, it's very straightforward. It's just there are unstable states. We can't, we don't come down gradually as oil drops. You know that idea of, oh, we'll have less and less oil and things will just contract. That would be one of those. And that's, it's, just, it's just a generalized way of talking about it. Sorry, that's probably not very clear. But I'm not in my <laughs> dynamical systems frame of mind this evening. How, looking at these diagrams, um, it says there's ecosystems that follow this pattern. Can mm -hmm. you maybe give some examples to illustrate, <clears throat> especially these that have this drop from? Um, I, I've, I've read examples about from lakes and eutrophication of lakes, where either the nutrient loading crosses the point where the lake just dies very quickly. Um, I've, I've read papers of it happening in heart attacks, in, in market crashes, in all sorts of things. The thing, that's the thing about them. They're generalized dynamics. Do you know what I mean? They're about how complex things behave. And uh, now, off the top of my head, I can't, can't. Like, what you'd find is a paper in science, and you'll find sort of graphs and things saying, look, here is commonality of behaviors. And that would be one interesting thing. If anybody is particularly interested in mathematics and analysis, you know, one of the things you notice among all classes of transitions, it seems, or, well, lots of classes of transitions that are approaching a collapse, is you start to see very, very similar dynamical behavior. And if you wanted to do it now, if somebody wanted a research project that they could get up and running quickly, you could probably do it with the financial system at this moment. You know, Nicole could probably point out some good indices to look at, but you, they're, they're, they're very clear, any system you could uh, Excellent. do it. Does complexity does it inherently require increased per capita consumption? Um, <clears throat> complexity is independent of per capita. Complexity increasing is an independent thing from per capita consumption. But per capita consumption increasing can drive complexity. Um, and for us, if we consume, like, I mean, if you had more people and we were all, you know, had more land and we just kept eating and we uh, eating more and we consumed more and ate more and just grew and grew, we could, there is a way that we might not complexify. But that's not the human way. That's not the way in a complex environment. As uh, Professor Tainter was saying earlier on, you know, we, if you have the energy and the other resources to deal with problems, and you're, we always have problems, some of them are external, some of them are about us. It is that status and sex and whatever that we're jockeying with each other. All of these present to us micro problems, and that's what produces complexity. So it's not really about consumption, so consumption is a consequence for us of how we do status dynamics, and it's one of the drivers of complexity. Could you define lock-in one more for us? What um, is lock-in? What does that mean? Um, it is, <clears throat> we live in a very complex environment, and we want to change something or not. Lock-in is your inability to get out of your own situation without doing some, you know, sorry, without doing something that would undermine some other part of your welfare. So it's about how, why you can't move, why we can't as a society move very far or clearly in dealing with our predicaments. Because again, I think the food example is best. I think that idea of uh, our food, we need to do something with our food, but if we do something with our food, we raise food prices and we decrease productivity. 
and that causes big problems straight away for us now in terms of the affordability of food. So we might end up having to eat less food and have less money and have banks toppling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just about being enmeshed in things that are one, that we can't really move. Number two, often are too complex to see. So when we talk about solutions to problems, what we're often doing is we're looking at one little part that we can analyze and that you're kind of going, yes, this is sol soluble if this is the only little part you have to look at. But the thing is, this little part, if you put it in, or firstly, if you pull out something and then try and put something else in, you run the risk of when you pull out something, you start destabilizing it, or you have an, un un uh, an unforeseen event that causes some sort of destabilization, or when you put this in, you cause some sort of destabilization. Now, most destabilizations might matter. It doesn't matter what sort of effects they have. But if those destabilizations start to break down your society or take your food security away or your economic security away, then you're locked in. You can't do this and you can't do that. You know you can't move forward. You know you can't move back. So you're locked into your, your particular patterns of behavior, even though you know that it is going to start falling apart around your ears. We're going to take, um, well, I'll ask you one more question, mm -hmm. and then we'll go to the microphone mm -hmm. and let people ask their own questions, which are rather complex in some cases. I'm jet lagged as well here. <laughs> How will we sustain the food system, any food system for that matter, in a fast or in the fast of financial deleveraging? In the fast of financial? Face of all of this. Um, the face of financial deleveraging. <laughs> firstly, I think ultimately, it, I don't know how you. I, I don't know. That's the first thing. I haven't a clue. I'm trying to answer it. I'm trying to help people, and they're trying to help me answer the question. Um, my model in general is Ireland, because it's something I have more a handle on. You know, I, I don't know about the United States. I don't know where your food is, what you're producing, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing I can say is, look, if it's, as I would expect, a very severe collapse, where basically there's mass, vast unemployment and all of that, I think, at least in Ireland's case, um, effectively you need some parallel programs. You need an emergency rationing system. You need a couple of other systems that ensure uh, uh, farmers can plant next year because that's seeds. But if you start commandeering food from farmers, what are they going to grow next year? Where are they going to get this? So you've got to ensure that there's some viability in farms. And that could be having effectively introducing a currency, which is a type of rationing system. Okay. So it is backed by the food that's coming out of the ground. But you still have got to get the food to the people and all of that. Um, and you need other processes. I mean, you know, our seed situation is appalling because we're all buying in our seeds now. I mean, some of you might have, or I know people who are saving their own seeds and all sorts of varieties. But to feed us all, we're all buying in these seeds. We're buying in spares, etc. Um, so there's another side in parallel, which is about trying to build a new resilient agriculture. And effectively, you could pay people workfare with your new minted food-backed currency uh, to do things like seeds, develop seeds, uh, develop also. There's really an awful lot to do in terms of horse breeding, et cetera, et cetera, that we have some experience in Ireland, but the wrong, probably some of the wrong types of horses, but there is experience. So about developing all of those things. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we need to get people growing. We need to give people jobs to do. You know, as uh, one of my colleagues in FASTA, um, she's worked with her husband in Africa for a long time. And she always said, you know the thing you have to look out for? 
you've got to look out for young men between the ages of 16 and 30. They will crucify you, or they can be your greatest benefit. You've got to make them your benefit. And that means you work them. You give them things to do. Because if you don't, you know, they will be a menace. And that's, she said that's in Africa, but I think that's true enough. So you've got to invent work for people. So part of dealing with your food security issue is having things ready to do. This is part of where preparation comes in. What are people going to do? There's food storage, there's animals, there's um, just you, you, you invent things. You need a book of things for people to do. And that becomes, you get them out doing that. That can be growing in gardens. It can be using other people's gardens. But the food security issue, I think, you know, in Ireland, at least, we're producing a lot of food. In a real crisis, we do have one solution. Um, when I said that our agriculture was, you know, all our agriculture is out of, you know, it's all phased for a globalized economy. You know, we produce 10 times more mushrooms than we eat. We produce vast 10 times or more, more beef than we eat. We don't produce enough vegetables, you know. So in a real emergency, actually, we just eat cattle for a year because we actually need to get some of those cattle off the land anyway because we need to get more planting. It's, very, it's quite energy intensive. They're not lot cattle, by the way. They're largely, they still have to get feed um, over winter, but largely they're grass-fed on the, on the fields. So there are things you do there for real high emergency, mid-level emergency, and general resilience planning and you need to get people fed. So you try and get multiple benefits. So that's kind of currency, food currency type things, having jobs to do. But this all requires preparation. That's what kind of gets, gives me the willies in a sense, is that you don't roll this out on the back of an envelope in the middle of a crisis. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's the whole logistics of it. How do, you get, how do you get these things to people? You know, what if there's, you have communications problems? Who deals with it? Where do they get them? How do they pick up their currency? How do you stop forgeries? Should we be, we've been saying, like, well, no, not listen to, but they're saying to uh, one of our ministers recently, we've got to be producing, we've got to have a new currency if we can do it quietly in stock, in the back room of any sort. You know, we've got to have these little pre preparations. You don't know what's going to happen. So you try and do things now that don't involve changing the world, our society, our Ireland, or announcing it from the hilltops, but that you've done some preparation work. Uh, civil society can do another part, but it's not civil society about pure localism. It's also civil society about what we can do with the grid and all of that, um, and not the grid, the sewerage. Um, it's interesting, if any of you are dealing with these things. Um, I wrote something about six months ago called Tipping Point about the systemic implications of peak oil. And two groups that got back to me were two, two of the groups that got back to me were two infrastructure companies, both heavily involved in sort of multi this big infrastructure, water, energy, da 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 da, da. Um, And what I've been trying to do, though it's a kind of difficult as well, is to sort of say, well, look, if you, can you tell me, you know, how much grid can we use? You know, when, when does the grid become unviable? All of these things. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm diverting from the question. I, I'm in this sort of semi vum state from, uh, What's it again from, you know, when you fly jet in lag. jet lag? Is there? <laughs> we, just, uh, we might want to mention that it, uh, it, here it is 8.30. For David, it's five hours later, actually. So it's 1.30 in the morning for his body right now. I'm not even partying. <laughs> let's, let's have some people go back to the mic right there 